they assemble at night, each one having prepared as diligently as possible the time given to them before the witching hour, the hour of rain, the time when they begin outdoor cartoon television. Stray casts is on the air. Is everybody in? Is everybody in? The ceremony is about to begin. When all else fails, we can still whip the horse's eyes because this is the internet where everything that you see and hear and read is true. We have found that out. It is a true story. I did not make that up. Uh, The winds of Thor, they blow so cold right here on this Wednesday night. We are sorry for the delay. Um, everything seems to be ready. Are you ready? Yeah. I threw a little Rolling Stones at you right there. I'm ready. Uh, tonight's a a big night here. I'm Pat Renwick. Um, and we were kind of thinking of something a little different to do. And we took the, um, the Bass Nazi blinders off this week. And we decided to bring you the one, the only. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Larry Dahlberg. He is coming at us here tonight. Larry Dahlberg, can you believe this? Uh, yeah, it's Larry can you, can Dahlberg. You hear me? Can you guys hear me? I can hear you great. All right, good, excellent. I can't hear me. Yeah, it's th- this guy who can't hear himself um, over here. Uh, he is actually a hot yoga instructor on the weekends. Bikram. Uh, he's a, yes, he's a bass fisherman also, and he plays Not the drums. True. And he co-hosts this amazing show, uh, the biggest little-known show on the web of bass fishing talk show, outdoor extravaganza, um, glorified version of a bass fishing talk show, outdoor cartoon television. Uh, the co-host here of Stray Cast, ladies and gentlemen, this is Ryan Popcorn Whitaker. This is this guy. Plays Three of the drums. four things you said were true. Yes. Can you guess which one is me? Plays the drums. It's a drummer. That is true. Yes. I don't yoga. You do hot yoga. No, I failed to sit and read. You eat like hot yogas. Time. High school. Couldn't Baroness Von Jenberg is here Ooh, over here in the house. Yoga. Baroness Von Jenberg. We love her too. She's here. That's good. No, I didn't the studio audience clap for her. <laughs> I don't even know what happened right here. Hey, uh, the, the guy over here on the other cam, um, he's my lawyer. He's the original hip hop fisherman. Uh, he is your royal highness. Ladies and gentlemen, you know him as J.P. Hi! Hey, J.P. Hi! J.P. Hi! Hi, J.P. Hi. Happy birthday. Thank you, thank you. Coming at you. You know, if you, in, in cat years, you're a lot older than you are in stray cast years. What is he in urban years? I'm not sure. He's, he's very urban. Something about him. The, uh, the guy producing that... <laughs> The guy producing the hell out of this show over here. The glass is always half full with this gentleman. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, this is Andrew Ellenberger. He is the Ginger Ninja. That's it. Ginger, wave to the camera. Say hi. Yeah. Yeah. Say hi. Ginger, are you going to grow a beard? We all have beards now. It's winter beard time. Ginger, you're not going to grow a beard? Why are you all red over there? Why are you all He's ginger. <laughs> He's ginger out the right there. Hey, more important uh, than the fact that um, Larry Dahlberg is coming on tonight, more important than the fact that we're doing this uh, internet talk show, the most important thing going on in the world today is that it is 
our fishing buddy's birthday today. I want to give a loud studio audience round of applause for our buddy, little Nolan Higgins. Happy birthday, Nolan. Woo! It's Nolan's birthday, guys. Happy birthday, Nolan. That's a pretty big deal. It's a pretty big deal. Happy birthday, Nolan. We love you, man. Hey, uh, if you're just tuning into this show for the first time, I want to remind you, um, all the past episodes are available on the iTunes, on StrayCast.net, and of course, on our Facebook page, the book Face StrayCast. Uh, hey, you know what? I usually tell you to put the power poles down and don't go anywhere, but I'm going to do it for you right now, today, double clicking right there, put the power poles down when we get back. Finally, it's Larry Dahlberg right here on StrayCast. Step up your game. It has been said that professionals are only as good as the tools they work with. And Alpha Angler has developed the ultimate set of tools for you, the competitive angler. Alpha Angler Custom Rods, brought to fruition by the passion of Master Craftsman Jake Boomer and 2017 BASS Angler of the Year, Brandon Palinick. Alpha Angler Rods are custom made in the USA designed and engineered to be perfect. Alpha Angler utilizes a very unconventional approach to making the very best bass rods from drop shotting to flipping. Alpha Angler's focus is on building perfectly balanced tournament grade bass rods at an affordable price. Join the Alpha Lusion today and purchase direct at alphaangler.com. Step up your game, alphaangler.com. The swim jig technique is one of the most successful ways to put fish in the boat. Time in and time out, Bravani Bait swim jigs are just the right tool for the job. Beaming with quality, the Bravani swim jigs come in a myriad of colors, feature the best premium hooks and solid trailer keepers to give you, the serious bass angler, the confidence you need to accomplish your goal of putting more fish in the boat. So go to BravaniBaits.com and start climbing the ladder to swim jig success. Taming the beast isn't easy, but the bigger your electronics, the more you have on the line. In conditions like this, you need the KVD Kong Extreme Electronics Mount. The only electronics mount designed and built to be rock solid. No movement, no matter how heavy your gear. A marine grade mount for fresh or salt water that's monstrously strong. The KVD Kong Extreme Electronics Mount.
Oh yes, oh my, oh my, oh my. Pretty good, pretty good, pretty neat, pretty neat. Yes, sir. Uh, we are back. Straight Cast Outdoor Cartoon Television. I'm Pat Renwick. Um, we are amongst royalty tonight, and I say this most sincerely. Thank you, Pat. Fish- no, not you, Ryan. Oh. Uh, Fishing Galaxy, we bring to you Sir Lawrence Dahlberg right here tonight. Yes, this is how we do it. This is how you internet talk show, right here. Yes, Mary Dahlberg, the heck are you doing here? I'm not here. I'm I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> if you're if if you're all here, then we're all there tonight. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. Depending on what all there means, I'm not sure how it applies to you guys. <laughs> is this Yogi Bear, <laughs> dude. This awesome man. We are pretty stoked to have you on tonight. And and I, when I say royalty I, I mean that because like i we do this whole bass thing you know we're bass nazis okay we really are and we have b- professional bass fishermen on beanies or nazis did you say I've... wait what did you say <laughs> weenies or not yeah both yeah, yeah we're definitely both yes we're, we're definitely both um and <laughs> and i i have i have yet to feel that i am amongst fishing royalty with the exception of maybe when Jerry McInnes was sure. on the show. Yeah. Oh, and Forrest Wood. Forrest Wood. Yeah, Forrest Wood, too. But, but, name dropping. But, yeah, I mean, I'm a name dropper. It's kind of what, what we do here. <laughs> but, but, Larry, seriously, man, um, dude, it, it is an honor to have you on here today. And I just wanted to get the ass kissing out of the way right away. You know, that's what I, I, I do. I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, that, that's what I wanted to do, Larry. But, um, man, you have been around the world you have gone the gamut of the whole fishing all nine realms of the of the fishing galaxy you have traveled um i would like to hear from you and we'll call this larry in his own words um a little bit of larry Dahlberg history and can you kind of start us larry um let's say from the time that you entered the fishing industry give us just a little synopsis would you please well, I guess it depends on uh, the if it, getting paid to to fish or getting paid to you know like pick a night crawler uh, would depend on you know when my entry uh, happened. <laughs> That's how I started too. Yeah, I got counts. used to get paid to pick night crawlers. Yeah, say p- paid to pick night crawlers ten times fast, <laughs> holding your tongue, Larry. Try that That's, one first. Yeah, yeah or. Yeah, <laughs> but no. When you first came into the fishing industry, as, as not picking night crawlers, but I mean, what happened. Uh, I was I, I was a born like addicted to fishing. I came out of the womb, and I just something there was something wrong with me from the time I was really young. And my parents recognized it and just let me run loose, uh, which is you know a good thing. We could do that in a small town. You let your dogs and your kids just run loose, and they come home when it's time to eat. Yep. And I had a grandpa on my mom's side that was a kind of a woods animal, and all he did was fish with a live bait. My dad was strictly a lure guy. They fished together once. And uh, my grandpa had me come along because uh, I learned to row the boat real, real early age, and it allowed him to kill twice as many fish legally because there was two people there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he, he fished for sturgeons and uh, cats and anything else that, uh, you know, ate night crawlers. So we caught, you know, walleyes and smallmouth and so on. And with my, with my dad, it was, uh, you know, running a boat and uh, throwing, throwing lures for uh, muskies or we'd uh, anchor and swing lures through uh, pools. Uh, for walleyes. And so I got a pretty broad uh, view of kind of a couple of different worlds. And um, uh, I was fairly uh, trustworthy as a, as a youngster and as a very, very young guy, uh, my dad would let me uh, go away for two or three days all by myself floating down this river. Uh, uh, like, 20 miles with no food or water in three days. Uh, I eat a little brook trout that I catch in a, a stream and he'd pick me up and, uh, you know, you see any muskies and, uh, a guy died when uh, I was 11 that worked for a private smallmouth bass fishing club. Old Charlie died. They called my dad emergency. And, uh, he said, nah, take the, take the kid. He knows where the bass are. So I got a tryout and, uh, we caught all kinds of bass and, uh, 
Uh, I started working as a as a fishing guide when I was 11 years old and wow. did it for uh, 20 some years. And it was kind of fun because I, I kind of knew where a lot of them uh, were because I'd get up in trees and throw crayfish in. You know, I knew like there's an orange rock there. You can't see it unless you climb that tree. <laughs> um, right above it, there's a, and uh, the other guides I didn't know it at the time. I didn't realize it, but um, they knew the banks where the bass generally hung out, but they didn't like know like very specific. So this first old guy that I took, it, it, he thought I was a savant. He said, no, a little further. Okay, get ready. Right about there. Okay, get ready. I go boom. They come out. He go what? Calling your shots. Yeah, well, yeah, like I, that's what that's what fishing's about to me, and it always kind of has been. Is uh, um, I don't want any voodoo or mystery or anything. I want them to answer when I ring the doorbell. <laughs> and it's a kind of existential, you know. When they they bite, you know they're there. You know that you're there also. You feel the tug. You're connected. And there's a sort of a security in knowing that. Yep, if I put it right there, I'm going to get a bite. And I like that feeling. Yeah. Taking the element of surprise sure right out of it. Yeah, no, no. Because it comes, the first time it was a surprise, maybe. Well, you were expecting one there, you wouldn't have threw it there. Right. Well, you don't know how big the fish is going to be. That's true, too. That's 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 true. But it's, it's just a matter of um, when you get in the groove, you know, in... In any any fishing kind of a thing, you know, and you sniff sure. it out and, and you kind of get in the groove and it's just discovering the groove that's what's most fun. Uh, catching the fish is secondary. When when, it, when it's right, it's right. And and you kind of, and you feel it. That's, that you hit it on the head there. I mean, when yeah. we're out there on, 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 the, on the water and yeah. it's going our way, I mean, it's going our way. But then there's the other side of the coin, Larry. Sometimes it just goes horribly wrong. It, it just like, sometimes you like, blow your trailer hub on the way to the lake. It, it's like playing yeah. music. You sit down with a bunch of guys, and you know somebody might be playing bass and drums. It just doesn't come out, you know, or you're out of tune. Uh, when it's right, you get there, and Mother Nature's playing the beat and, and the and the bass and the key and the and all that. And uh, if you can get down and just jam right along and be in that groove, you're there. Uh, and it's just like with me. You, some days it just won't come out. And some days it will, and um, you just got to let it happen. Now, Larry, you you uh, you're one of the original in fishermen, is that correct? Well, I guess if you go back a ways, I was one of the one of the first uh, guys for sure hired outside the Linder family. Way back in the songbook, there. Well, yeah, depends on what your songbook is. It would be. I started working <laughs> with that I guess, in the early eighties. <laughs> that's that's way back after all the good music was done but anyway sorry <laughs> <laughs> that's way back no but um yeah man uh, you were like um so why did they kick you out of the in fisherman what'd you do oh i didn't do anything we just were went in different directions they i wanted to really pursue the professional walleye trail to a great degree and uh, i was more interested in branching out in a lot of different uh, directions. We built some vertical publications and one of them was a, a travel pub. And, uh, we just sort of, I didn't want to do the, the walleye thing as a focus. And uh, we parted and the next uh, like three days after I, I quit, we wound up in Costa Rica with a guy that was a Chevy advertising uh, head and uh, the guy that was a head of advertising for Abu and Strand, and a guy named Barchek who had uh, kind of engineered the uh, like a rock campaign for Chevy, real bright, yeah. real funny. Guy. And we figured out, you know, I had some ideas for a TV show, and, and Barchek came up with the idea: just make a short format, real high impact deal. It'd be hard for the media ladies to measure it, so it'll probably be easier to sell. And uh, I did a, a pilot and sent it to ESPN. And uh, waited about a long time, six months or something. And I got this call, quick, come to New York. I'll meet you at the airport. And uh, that's how the hunt for big fish started. Nice. And what year was that about? Uh, 1991. 91. Wow. Yeah. And, and going ever since. How many oh, episodes? Yeah. How many episodes of Hunt for Big Fish are there? Mm -hmm. The first years I built 26 five-minute pieces. 
many of which I could expand into, you know, full half hour shows easily. So probably 260, 300 or so of those. And then uh, the next number of years up until uh, last year, uh, built half hour shows. So, you know, you do the math. I don't know. There's a whole bunch of them. It's more than Seinfeld. I just figured it out right there. That's more episodes than Seinfeld. <laughs> This is pretty good, Larry. It's pretty damn yeah, good. Yeah, airing right now. The, the Hunt for Big Fish classics are airing on uh, WFN. Yeah. Invocation. Yep. Yeah. I mean, and I don't know. It's like they, they kind of all are classics because you're you're basically out there fishing for fish that are pretty much on everybody's bucket list, man. I mean, you're knocking the bucket list off. Every- well, you know, when I started... They weren't on many people's bucket list because nobody knew what they were. Yeah, what the hell they were. Right. Yeah. And uh, I've been blank with you. We always did the exotic fishing, quote unquote, and fishermen was going to Canada. Yeah. And uh, the people that were in charge of, uh, had been in charge of the circulation of the magazine and I were but it hits constantly about that. Our audience is Canadian. Well, no, our audience wants to catch something cool. You're like, yeah. look at this exotic yeah, grayling I just caught. They don't well, all want to catch place, a walleye. You know, look at the distance. You know, look at the distance from here to here, and then make it a, a, a circle. <laughs> don't deny the equatorial regions. But anyway, <laughs> um, uh, there was a. You know, I had some curiosity about seeing different environments and different species of fish. So that's. I think we had the first. In fact, when I was at In Fisherman, we put the first peacock bass on TV. I convinced Al to go down to Gurry Reservoir. Uh, when I, <laughs> I just remembered some things. <laughs> Please share. <laughs> Gurry, Gurry Reservoir in Venezuela. And we met up with this guy named Jacob Elias. Great guy. And he had a Ranger bass boat. Unbelievable. And we went, went out. We caught some fish on this. Uh, island that was sort of flat and uh you know real typical now that i know about peacocks you know a place where they might be but it was kind of shaly and i heard this these noises like it sounded like real heavy machinery and the dam had just been built and it was just flooding this big huge thing and you could hear this noise like the hell is that roaring and i thought it was heavy machinery building a wing wall uh on the backside of some trees and we'd been fishing in and through these trees what we could get through anyway and found that anywhere there was a lay down in a, on an 18 foot shelf if we jig a, a big giant rattle traps and spots we could catch peacocks that were in the low teens and it was pretty fun sure uh, no action on on top uh, back in the wood but again <laughs> hear this roaring we, we got to get back because maybe in the other side of this there'll be a big rocky wing wall open area edge we can, and we can barely get through because they're 60, 80 foot trees in, in, you know, 20 feet of water flooded. It's, it's jungle. And as we get back and in and in and in, the noise getting louder and louder. And we realize it's howler monkeys and, and they're uh, territorial guys. And they've all been kind of uh, jammed together because of the flood. <laughs> Noah hadn't built an ark. And they're all up in the canopy in this area. And that's what's making the noise. And we get underneath them and they start crapping in their hands and throwing it at us. <laughs> you, can't, you can't throw it back for too high. You can't turn the boat around because it's too, and we're fighting our way in there. Now we got to fight our way out, but we're going backwards, you know, pushing with the truck. And it was awful. The boat was like ankle deep in monkey shit. You're in a literal and shit it storm. Stings and, yeah. and it stinks. And uh, we never could get back at them. We couldn't do anything about it. It was a, uh, Humiliating. The the irony of that is that Ryan and I were actually in a band called Howler Monkey once right. together. Yes, back in the day, the old it Howler was also Monkeys. Also a shit storm. Yeah, yeah. We, we we did all monkeys tribute songs too. It was a cover band. Did you have a yeah. song called like Shit Storm or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, Shit Storm is what we closed with. That was shit our storm big, blues. Shit, that was our big number. Okay. I love that. <laughs> it well, big... that's really interesting. <laughs> Thanks. Riveting. <laughs> yes, riveting. Absolutely riveting, Larry. No, but <laughs> seriously, the, the the howler monkeys. I, you, that's that's something that's in the that memory insane. bank right there. That's wow. nuts. We don't get that in um, in Northwest Indiana or in uh, in Chicago. No, if I there's, hear a sound like that, I mean, I there's no howler it. monkeys here. Yeah. Hey, uh, if I want to remind everybody that we will be taking calls, Larry's going to take some questions from you, uh, the viewing audience, the listening audience. The uh, number is five two zero. 
214-2277. That's 520-214-BASS-2277. Um, Larry, uh, quite a few accomplishments, man, over the years, for real, dude. Um, the, the Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame member, that's you. Um, you got the Conservation uh, Award from the IGFA, the biggest award you could possibly get, the most prestigious award from the IGFA. That's you. Uh, also, member of the IGFA Hall of Fame. I mean, did you ever think, if you look back, let's go back in the songbook again, um, by the, when you were picking night crawlers that, and you were <laughs> guiding guys at 11 years old? that Throwing this, crawfish out of trees? Yeah, dodging monkey shit? Did you ever think that this would be the Larry Dahlberg that sits and talks now? It's crazy. Uh, no. no, no, I never thought I would leave uh, Burnett County. It's a little town, you know, I grew up in a little town of 931 people, and I pretty had it, pretty much everything I thought I needed within about a 30-mile radius. So I didn't have uh, many plans to leave. Yeah, I mean, it, it's... Well, I, I just, you know, just sort of went down the river. <laughs> you chuggled on down, didn't you? You were chuggling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I said before, it's like a knuckleball headed toward home plate, taking the path of least resistance, trying not to hit anybody before I get to the catcher. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, we always talk on this show how we overcomplicate things as fishermen. We have a tendency to overcomplicate things constantly. Now, you go and travel to exotic places and go fishing um i don't know how the hell you pack for that stuff because like if i'm going fishing just for the weekend around here i'm still bringing man's auger tail worms from 1986 with me just in case they want to eat those you know those are loaded in my boat how, how the heck do you figure out what you're gonna bring on these trips man do you have do you have a method of simplifying your selections well, my premise is that a fish does not care what he's caught on. Gotcha. Okay. I like it. <laughs> and so I look at it like uh, I need a couple different kinds of screwdrivers. Uh, you can use socket wrenches, and then there's crescent wrenches. How much space have you got? And there's certain lure families that are like crescent wrenches, uh, and then others that are more fine-tuned. So what I do is try to pack a box, and I know something uh, about the environments. Now, I know a lot more about environments than I did uh, you know, 20 or 25 years ago, that's for sure. And so it's much easier. But uh, I'm saying, okay, I'm going to be fishing somewhere from zero to X number of feet in the water column, and I'm going to be fishing for a fish that is capable of eating items from this big to this big. What's the smallest number of things that I can put into a box will allow me to cover that amount of space in the in the body of water that I'm fishing for uh, at the widest uh, range of speeds. And then I would pack a box, uh, a real good box, not big, uh, of live bait gear that would allow me to uh, access uh, various fish from two or three, four inches long up to, you know, whatever for that I might want to use for live bait. And then I just go from there and I bring stuff with me uh, that I can make and modify. Now, what what is the uh, category? What what's one bait that that has caught fish for you everywhere in the world? Is there one bait that you always take with? Uh, Mr. Wiggly. Oh, oh, Mr. Wiggly. I knew that was the answer. I don't even know why. I asked. You knew that. You knew that. <laughs> and and uh, an amazing creation, Mr. Wiggly. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't hurt you when you fish with it. A lot of baits really hurt. <laughs> you don't realize it you know, until you get old. I mean, uh, a lot of the most effective lures are, are lures that have a random non-mechanical action and uh, lures that maybe glide a long ways or move in a certain way. And <clears throat> many of them have a lot of mass. And in order to really make them do what they need to do, you got to kind of zip them just right. Uh, the way you'll kind of whack them. And it takes a, a lot of energy, especially as uh, in the musky world, we use lot, rods that are longer and longer, and the amount of leverage that's against you is real significant. Uh, even holding one in your hand, you've got a half a pound of torque against you. Just just holding it with the tip of nine-foot musky rod, go figure it out. You've got 
at least a half a pound of torque just in sure. your hand. But anyhow, um, uh, Wiggly is really cool because uh, you throw it a million miles. You can work it from zero to a thousand miles an hour. Make it really zig and zag around. And if you get the zipping and popping and snapping down, it's uh, it's kind of magic a lot of times. Yeah, absolutely. And we've seen some outstanding results with that. You're you're kind of like Dr. Frankenstein, man. Your laboratory has created some amazing monsters. Um, well, you I'm, know, it's you can go through the era. I started making stuff. My dad was a do-it-yourselfer. Everybody was where I grew up. Uh, there were old cheap Swedes that didn't have access to much, so they'd look at something and say, oh, I could make that. <laughs> and they, you know, might be kind of big and clunky, but it had, it had suit the suit the purpose. And we built, you know, little flies, black gnats, and then uh, stuff uh, to uh, catch uh, bass, poppers, uh, uh, smallmouth poppers. And my dad built uh, musky lures and stuff. And as a kid, I, you know, did that sort of thing. And, uh, did a lot of fly tying as I, as I was a guide. I guided fly fishermen. And uh, I was more into not what does it look like, what does it do? Uh, you've got things that are what I would call dynamic that move and then things that are static. And um, it's my feeling that uh, very often what they do is more important than what they look like. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Now, for those of you out there that don't know, I'm going to run a couple things by you here that have been created in Larry Dahlberg's laboratory, okay? Um the blank through design on a rod, the blank through before they were just stuck into the handle. Here comes Larry Dahlberg creating stuff. Uh, you got the balancer. Remember the balancer? I remember the balancer. It was in the Bass Pro Shop catalog. I had to get it. When I saw it, I had to get of weights it. In there? Yeah, and then if you run out of weights, you put quarters in there. Exactly. Larry had it all dialed or in. Washers. Yeah, uh, for sure. The George Foreman grill. You actually created the George Foreman grill. Not a lot of people know that. It's a true story I just made up right there. The Dahlberg diver. Come on. Not the Ronnie James Dio holy diver, but the Dahlberg diver. You created that. The craw, fra the craw bait. The craw imitation bait. The clacker. The clack and craw. The clack and craw. The frog. That frog deal you got. Um, Mr. Wiggly, of course. Your glide bait. You got the glide bait, too. And of the whopper freaking plopper. Larry Dahlberg. Larry Dahlberg, you did this. It's about the hottest thing out there right now. You did this, Larry Dahlberg. Unbelievable. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think of those apples? Uh, I don't know. I just, uh, I never had any, I don't usually have any idea of a, uh, making it for any other reason to try to catch a fish on so so uh, it just i'm just overwhelmed by the success of the whopper pop uh, and the variety of fish people catch on it and i get all these really cool uh, letters and pictures from people and it, it's kind of heartwarming actually it's kind of neat Outstanding. Awesome, it is, absolutely. Hey, what do you say uh we we take care of some of these fish on the line right now? You want to talk to some of your fans, Larry? Oh, sure. I'd be happy to. All right. Let's 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 do this. The number here to call in and talk to Larry Dahlberg, 520-214-2277. We got a fish on the line. Welcome to Stray Cass. How you doing? Who's calling? Hello. Hey, you're going to have to turn your, uh, your volume down here. Turn down your feed. Yeah, turn down the feed. Where would you like to put Mr. Wigley in? Hey. Hey. We need you to turn down the feed on the, the show that you're watching right now. There's a delay there. Hello? Sure, is that somebody from Mars? It is. It's from Plutron. They're fishing the canals. <laughs> Hi, caller. What's your name? Hey, this is uh, the Pudge and Black Magic Johnson here. Oh, nice. Talking with Pat Renwick. The Pudge and Black Magic Johnson. Yes. <laughs> How are you doing? The... Uh... <laughs> yeah, I feel pretty good. Hey, you, you, what do you what do you got to say to Larry Dahlberg, man? Hey, uh, we were just wondering where you put Mr. Wiggly at night. Where where you put, where I put Mr. Wiggly? I just leave him wherever he was when I went to bed. Who knows where you put him? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Wiggly is a producer at all times. Hey guys, you gotta you gotta turn the feed down. It's crazy. 
Hey, thank you very much for calling. Yeah, thanks for the call. <laughs> that was the Pudge in Black Magic Johnson. That's pretty cool. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Larry, is that a Santana song? I, I think so. I, I, I think it is. Do you um? What is the most elusive game fish on the planet, Larry? What's the most elusive game fish on the planet? Well, a lot of it depends on the environment, not on the fish. There's lots of different fish that are put in an environment without very much protection. They're very, very, very hard to get close to. Okay. Um, so it depends on what's the definition of elusive. Um, rarity uh, or difficulty to get to could be uh, one of the things. Um, hardest to fool could be another. Yeah, I, I think a, a real big, huge, giant carp it, uh, to get it to bite. Uh, uh, sometimes you have to use a tiny little fly. I used to be just confounded uh, many years ago when I was in college. I had these carp. I'm not kidding you. They had to be pushing five feet. They had to be, wow. I'm, I'm telling you, 70 pound class. They're oh, like wow. that big around. And guys have, have, have arrowed them in this water that are in that range even today. And I could get a, the only thing they'd react to was a little, like a little uh, emerger. And I'd hook them, and I'd have them off for like 18 inches or 24 inches, and they'd, they'd be filling in a algae or something, they'd get hung up, and I'd break off. And for me, that was one of the most elusive fish that I've ever dealt with. And what are those, grass carp? No, they were just common carp. Yeah, common be, carp at five-footers, dude. That's a beast. They get really big. Carp get very, very large. Ah, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah very, very ones. fast, too. Big ones in Lake Michigan here too, and I try catching them. I used to try catching them a lot. I agree, they're they're tough. You know, yeah, they're in that clear water. You know, you can bait them up and catch them, um, and get them to bite on dough balls and stuff. You leave, you know, you, you bait an area. But I don't, I don't really like them very much. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I like I like fish with teeth and fish that come up and bite. I like my my favorite fish at home. Yeah. I really like uh, smallmouth bass, and I really like muskies. Those are the two favorites. Yeah, I really like them a lot. Those are the main I like guys. walleyes, but I, I don't like to catch them that much. You, you talked about fish with teeth, man. Do you, like, I, I apparently you don't, but, like, even sometimes if I catch, like, a grinnel, you know, like, or mudfish or something, They're you know? They're great fish. It, like I get a little, I get a little skeeved out by them, man. It's like you got to grab them things just right, dude, because they don't give up. And I imagine a lot of these toothy critters that that yeah, you I catch. What did you say, Larry? I love those fake dogfish. Excellent. Yeah, but I mean, you're you're fishing for these exotics, like those those fish that that um that uh, jump into trees and eat the monkeys and the and the tiger fish and the and I mean. D- you don't the seem piara. to have the pyaras, yeah, and the and the the, the tigerfish and the wolffish and the doradas. You, you got to watch out. You can't put your hands in their mouth. Yeah, stuff. good good thinking, Larry. <laughs> but I mean, you don't seem to to show any fear when you grab those. Is it is that over experience or is it just something that like you're like mentally all right? I'm going for this. I'm doing it. I didn't even think about it. Just grab them. Yeah, the camera's on. You got to grab them. Just, but it's a fish. <laughs> yeah, but what about those giant catfish? I seen you grabbing so that. Was a shark. Like that catfish could swallow you. Was that in the in the tsunami? Oh, in Suriname, yeah. That Suriname. Was, that was really, really a big one. When we lifted that up, we had three guys. We were trying to lift it. We could not lift it. Three guys. And I went, oh, and my arm was like, God, what was that? And it actually went up his bunghole all the way to my elbow into the, <laughs> into the interior of this catfish. And that was the grossest thing that has ever happened. To oh, my oh, my God. Oh, my God. Did you find I out if it was male up. or female? Come on. Come on. <laughs> Holy cow, that happened. And if he had taken off at that moment, I mean, <laughs> right? What a way to go. He yeah, would have went for a ride. <laughs> oh, my God. Hey, are you, yeah. like, what do you think of that River Monster show? Is like, is that kind of like a Dahlberg deal? <laughs> no, because I, I usually catch them. And I can't <laughs> <laughs> no, it's more Thank of you for a, completing that's our thoughts. That's, that's a murder mystery, kind of. 
It's a murder mystery. It's like, yeah, because yeah. because there's killer tarpon everywhere. You know that, right? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah that guy's a much better actor than I will ever <laughs> Uh, yeah, whenever whenever somebody t- you know a non fisherman or something tells me to watch river monsters or whatever, I'm like, watch the hunt for big fish. If you want to see river monsters, that that's that's the real show. Because again, you're actually catching. I I, them. I don't want to put it say anything bad about the guy, but I can tell you this: he he's followed me to a bunch of spots and called golf guys that I fish with. Aha! Uh-huh. <laughs> he's a sight friend. fisherman, is what you're telling my, us. My good buddy uh, Caesar Pattern, who I shot a many shows with, who. Unfortunately, he was killed in a plane crash in January uh, a year ago. Oh. Yeah, Cesar. Oh. Yeah, Cesar. Uh, he called Cesar, and Cesar told him, man, I've seen you fish. I've seen you cast. If it ain't going to work. You'd be in the trees all the time. You'll find somebody else. You'd drive me nuts. <laughs> so, he came, he, so he came to Suriname, and he, and he fished on the same rivers that we fished, the same area, and, and spent two weeks and caught one wolf fish. And, and his cameraman got hit by lightning. I don't know if that means anything. Oh. It's because he was holding his spinning reel upside down. That's why. <laughs> That's probably why. That, that's a conductor right there, Larry, yeah. is what happened. Okay. Jeremy Wade Boggs. He used to be a pitcher. You know, so. I was thinking of that as, as a matter of fact. Write this down. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> remind me of us an idea. Okay. For a spinning reel? Yeah. If you put a deal in it so it generates electricity, you could plug, you could have, you could, put your cell phone, plug it into it. And these kids that are, you know, got to be playing with their stuff all the time and don't want to be, they could have a deal. They could charge their cell phone. They were cranking. Them. Get that kids into the, fishing. That'll get them the into you, fishing. The YouTubers thing yeah. too. They yeah. Keep their cameras running. Yeah. Good, good idea. Yeah they, yeah. they could be watching fishing shows on YouTube and turning the reel. And, yeah. Well, anyway. He's an idea, man. He feeds the mayonnaise to the tuna fish too. It's Larry Dahlberg. <laughs> He's giving us out ideas. Right here. Generating spin reel. <laughs> That's solid. It, so what's the most um, the most danger that you have ever been in? What's the most danger you have ever been in in your travels, Larry? Mm. Well, there was one time or two that were pretty, actually pretty scary. One, uh, we were in um, Africa, and uh, I thought I was fishing for a fish called a bundu, catfish. A bundu. <laughs> And uh, it's a fun word. I felt this kind of a, uh, uh, and I had stand up gear, you know, heavy gear that I would use for a thousand pound mile. Sure. And uh, I kind of locked up on it and started to try to pull, and it came toward the boat and was like right below the boat. It wasn't that deep of water, maybe 10, 12, 15 feet of water. And uh, as I bared down it real hard, the boat went down and water started coming in the back. So I couldn't pull that hard. It was a boat that only had a little bit of freeboard like a, a bass boat and we had coolers all over in the boat. So it was a lot of uh, weight and no room on the floor. And my wife was with me and the a guide was with me and the guy named Grant ran the camp and the cameraman. So we had a lot of, a lot of weight. So I just kind of backed off on it and then started easing it up and, and it sh- woo, moved like six feet left, woo, six feet right back and forth. And I couldn't real slow, woo, woo, and I lifted up again, and it came to the surface, and it was a crocodile longer than our boat. Holy oh, shit! And, and it was like three feet away from where my toes were on the edge of the boat. All of a sudden, he's just underneath, you know, he's straight up, straight under, you know, and I'm just nursing him up, and off it comes, and it's like, oh, and I went, it's a croc, and it, there were three octaves. It's a croc. <laughs> <laughs> And the, he kind of opened his mouth and shook a little bit. And, you know, they can leap like two-thirds of their length just with a kick of their tail. So he could have been in the boat. I mean, he was at boat level. We had four inches, two inches, three inches of free board. And that could have been really, really dangerous. Could have gone wrong. I had to come up and, and swipe. My cameraman was on the side of the boat, and he swiped like this with his trail and tried to knock the cameraman off uh, the side of the boat, which uh, – is there footage of that? What's that? Oh, my wife is there, just. Is there here. footage of that? Say? Of the oh, uh, Dutch Harbor. Harbor. I forgot about that. We had a oh, that was nasty. You know where Dutch Harbor is, where the Aleutians go out toward uh, Russia. Okay. Uh, yeah. Nasty, nasty. Bering Sea, forty-two degree water. Monster, monster swells. Fifty, seventy-five foot swells. We were in this little uh, boat with a single engine. Uh, V8 car engine, Chris Craft had a cabin in it and stuff, and the steering cables broke, and uh, we're way the heck out. 
and we were going out. We had to turn, we had to tear it all apart and put the steering cables around our our hands with gloves. My cameraman and I wanted each side. It was one guy pull, and then no, you pull. No, you know, right, left, and you know, the captain. And we only had one screw on the boat, and we got turned around in a big monster break. We had survival suits on. Marilyn was crying. That was a bad deal. Wow. Uh, worst deal though. Uh, we we're in uh, Venezuela and had flown over the Orinoco at a place uh, called uh, Puerto Ayacucho. There's a giant rapids, kind of a falls thing. There, a cauldron of water that goes down it. It's just a maelstrom of water. And I saw it, and at the bottom end of it, it'd be a natural barrier of, of monumental uh, order. So I figured there'd be PIR there, and we had to be there for a couple of days before we went in to fish peacock bass at the, in a river called the Passimony, where uh, we ended up catching a 43-incher. Wow. But anyway, we... Uh, Find a guy at the airport, uh, and yeah, sure, he's got a boat and comes up with three boats, a little tin, lightweight, little thin, like beer can thick boats, and we've got a 40-horse motor on this thing. And he gets in, the guide gets in, this guy can't speak English, camera gets in, I said, I'm not getting in, man, the boat's too small. So he gets out, and we, we take off, and the guy turns left, and we're kind of going downstream, and I think, what? We should be going upstream. This doesn't feel right. And then he kind of turns the boat around. He's going upstream and just holding in the current, which is very, very fast. And then the other two boats come zipping by us and go downstream and through the chute on the far side. And there's big, giant standing waves on the uh, on the inside and the far side. There's a, a chute that you can go through, but otherwise there's standing waves that are six, eight feet tall for 150 yards where it goes off over this big rock, basalt, crack thingamajig and our guy starts up and takes after him um, and the reason he's waiting is because he doesn't know where to go I can see that you know I've been a guide I can see what he's doing and I tell my cameraman quick get your ass off the seat you know drive it through the top of your head he's gonna hit these guys waves you know and secure the camera so he dumps the camera quick in the in the cooler and gets his butt up and he's uh, looking back this way I'm looking forward my butt's up I'm holding on the gunnels and bam we hit this wave oh. And his eyes get real big, and he hollers, the motor fell off. Oh, and, I turned and, looked, and the motor was indeed off. And the guy in the back was slumped over like this with a great big giant cut over his eye like this. And this big flap of skin is hanging down where it exposed his whole bones and everything. It was really icky. Oh. And <laughs> we get swept down into these uh, standing waves and take on probably 50 gallons of water in this small boat. And we are absolutely helpless. I'm running around like a squirrel looking for something to just control the boat, a rudder, and there's not an oar, there's not a life jacket, there's not a nothing. It's, it's, I've got $40,000, $50,000 worth of camera gear and my fishing gear and a half-dead guide, and we're in the middle of a big washing machine. It's bad. And if we go down much, well, we're screaming and yelling and waving our arms, and the other guys come in, and uh, it's a long story how we got out, broken ropes, crushed thumbs. Uh, we finally get on the other on a bank that's kind of an island thing right above the big main chute where we would have gone another two and a half miles through through stuff that you, you would see on National Geographic with a lunatic and a raft maybe. <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be dead. And as we got closer to shore, I realized the motor's drag and it's on a rope and it just bounced off. And if that thing had caught, we'd have gone down like a cork. And wow. Let's say no life jackets or anything. So we pulled the motor up, got it in the boat, got this guy in, got him patched up uh, with butterflies, pulled the plugs in the motor, flipped it upside down, pulled it a few times, got him screwed back in, put it back on. And I just said, man, the trip is over and I'm driving. Yeah. <laughs> Went back and and uh, survived that. <laughs> Thank God. Oh that God. That is crazy. That was a close. That was really, really a close. I think that wins. I think that wins over the 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 uh, the crocodile. Well, that croc. Those things are mean. Yeah, still, but it's, I mean, it, I, like putting your head in the head of a lion and taking it out. You know, in the mouth of a lion and taking it out. It could have bit me, but it didn't. Yeah, dude, that's. Crazy. I didn't hear what you ended up doing. Did you just cut? You cut the lion, right? For the croc? No, I, I just uh, put slack and I shook it like this, and the hook hadn't penetrated. It was a big hook, and just ah. and it dropped out, and it just sunk down. It, yeah. it let go of the whopper plopper. Sure, is yeah. what it did. <laughs> yeah, I've had a lot of. They chase whopper ploppers like you would not believe. 
Black <laughs> wow. caimans come after and green caimans and alligators and crocodiles really, really light up on a plopper. Larry, your wife Marilyn must go crazy every time you leave on these trips after hearing stories like that. Uh, eh, yeah, she's got good, I've got pretty good insurance. <laughs> <laughs> she's got some sort of double, and I forget what it is. Where if I get killed like that, she gets paid like double or triple. So she encourages it. <laughs> she encourages it. <laughs> hey, we're doing this thing on the uh, on the Facebook Live too, Larry, and um, we have some questions from your fans on the Facebook Live. Um, and JP High, you haven't met JP High. His last name is High. It's spelled. Hi, JP High. Hi. What? What's up, Larry? Uh, Larry, well, JP, what's going on? What are they asking, Larry? Uh, we got David Hall wants to know, what's the next lure to come from another segment of sport fishing that'll be a big player in bass fishing? Hmm. I actually know the answer to that, but I can't tell you. Oh, come on, no, we, Larry. We, we want the dirt. That's what we do. On this, this is stray cast. The this dirt. is the outdoor extravaganza glorified version of a, a fishing talk show. All right. Here, here's, here's what my theory is that... Oh boy. Okay. We've had tournament fishing and it starts out however it started out. We've got certain rules. You can't do a bunch of stuff. You can't do some stuff, rods of a given length, a bunch of really silly rules, really. Yeah. Yeah. In, in my, um, and we had boxing, you know, Marquis to Queensbury and then <laughs> MMA came along and we all forgot about boxing because MMA actually we've got to watch it evolve from, you know, which style of fighting is the best, which combination of those and so on. And obviously the answer is that the guys that have the best at all of them are the guys that are really the best and are the best at executing as well. Yes. I don't think angling's any different. And so I think that in the bass tournament world, what I'd really like to see is um, no holds barred bass. Wow. Talk to me. Um, Buck Perry, you guys know that. Absolutely. The spoon plugger, bub. And uh, more than sp spoon plugging was a set of wrenches. Okay, gotcha. First set of wrenches. You let out this many feet of no bow with a 100 series spoon, spoon plug. It's going to run exactly this depth no matter how fast you drive your boat or how slow. You let out this much line, it runs at exactly this depth. It would let you know exactly where you were and cover territory. And Buck also came up with the concepts of both structure and cover and laid out a systematic way to eliminate unproductive water without any voodoo at all. Nice. The, he's the Isaac Newton of modern angling, I think. Agreed. His methods are illegal in bass tournaments, even <laughs> though he laid the foundation with methods. That's what long are, lining in essence. What are they afraid? Are they afraid of something? Or, or do you have to something well anyway? What I would, I, I'd like to see is it just a modification where, you know, you have the same rules as you do now, except this the rod rule. Somebody asked me about it. Hey, Larry, what do you think about 10 foot rods? <laughs> I said, Ten, why stop at 10 feet? If you can catch more fish, somebody can show me to fish more effectively with a 47 foot rod. I'm all in. Show me. Yeah. <laughs> and it, by, by creating rules, uh, you're, you're limiting the growth of knowledge. Uh, what it's all about is discovering. And you have to be able to push the edges to discover things. If you make all these little rules, you'll never learn, you'll never discover anything. And in fishing, that's the beauty of it. It's 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 organic. It isn't somebody didn't reach up their butt, pull out a guy with a striped shirt, a whistle, a ball, and a clock and a rule book. We've got way too many of those things. We could invent a bunch right now if we wanted to. Fishing's beauty is that it's so organic, and you don't have all those uh, rules. And you know, and and. Uh, uh, in the bass tournaments with all these rules, it, it limits the growth of knowledge. And then the, the secondary thing, and uh, I was going to say about it, is uh, no hold barred bass. And his last day at the uh, live bait would be legal. You'd have to use circle hooks. Wow. And what people would see is, wow, there are some really good bass around here that nobody had been catching. <laughs> and it would make it way more interesting. And also uh, uh, give people more ideas about artificial lures to transpose what's been most effective with, uh, uh, with liveies. And I just think it'd be more interesting. And it, it's a no holds barred bass. And I'd, I'd find it far more interesting to have the same, uh, kind of a major league bass where every single fish counts and be just fun. Be cool. So everything goes. So trolling 20 yeah. flip sticks. Why not? 
Yeah. Like, whatever it takes. 18 and arm you Alabama can't, rigs. Can't, you can't break the, lo- the local uh, rules and regulations. Right. We're going to go another level. When it gets the live bait side, you've got to catch your own. Nice. With the cast net or the, or yeah. the, uh, the Hitachis. Uh-huh. Cast nets aren't legal in a lot of places. Neither are uh, sabikis. Either. Sabikis. I said Hitachis. Oh, well, I understood what you meant. Could have said <laughs> so you have to but catch you, perch. You didn't actually give us a lure there. Yeah. He he, said he you just say said it. you, wanted, Dahlberg, you just want to see you want rules gone. Yeah. So what's the lure? What's what's the what's next? What's the one? crossover from another world into I just, fishing? I, I can't even remember now. <laughs> <laughs> he's well, taking well played. He's well taking played. the Seventh Amendment, whatever that is. He's right the there. Seventh Commandment. Amendment. <laughs> I don't know. It's. Uh, I said no, the Seventh the Commandment of uh, of angling. It's kind of a. <laughs> Oh, what I call it, an immutable law. So the, your odds of catching a really big fish are inversely proportional to how much you actually deserve it. Yes. <laughs> fish location presentation system is exactly. By how much you deserve it. Yes, that, that's exactly what it is. That's exactly what I said. Yes. <laughs> Larry, you ever been on a game show before? On a game show? Uh, no, I, I don't think I have. We're, we're going we're gonna to play game show. Are you ready? I sat with Wink Martindale at the Ace Awards once. <laughs> I did. Did you ever do anything wild with Chuck Barris from the Gong Show? I really like Chuck Barris a lot. <laughs> I like the, uh, the comic. We have the unknown. We're going to play. Pat, Pat used to play ping pong with Richard Dawson. Yes, so. I did, actually. It's a true story that he just made up. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to play a game called What's on Your Mind. And I am going to say a word or a phrase to you, and you tell me the first thing that pops to your mind in correlation to trips that you have taken across the world. Okay? Okay. All right. Are we going to try this? I, I'm, 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 I'm ready. Do you got your thinking cap on, Mr. Dahlberg? I do. Okay. Let's play What's on Your Mind. Are you ready? Ah, yes. It's time for What's on Your Mind. With international traveler, fisherman extraordinaire Larry Dahlberg. His royalty, Sir Lawrence Dahlberg. He is here. Larry, this is how you play What's on Your Mind. Okay, I'm ready. The first word to you is beetle nut. Beetle nut. New Guinea. New Guinea. Yeah. New Guinea. It's beetle yeah, nut. Yeah, the beetle nut shuffle. The beetle nut shuffle. It's kind of a big dance over there, isn't it? I've got a song called The Beetle Nut Shuffle. All the kids are doing it. Uh, the ones in New Guinea are, I'll tell you that. But you also have to have the mustard stick and the calcium powder. <laughs> it enhances it. It's the synergistic effect of the it, beetle nut. It doesn't work without it. Okay. Oh, is that true? Absolutely. So there they is a synergistic. Beetle nuts in them. What you do, you peel the, the outside skin off the beetle nut. And then you dip the the uh, little mustard stick. It's a it's a bush. It's a little green, um, somewhat wet little stick, big as a pencil maybe or smaller. And then you dip it in this ground up stuff. It's calcium. Uh, they they use coral or they use seashell. And then you you chew the nut and bite the the uh, stick with the calcium on it, and it trickles blue, and it turns bright 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 red, and uh, your gums get all red, and your teeth turn black eventually. And, and, and you well, did... there you want beetle nuts, buddy. Uh, I should be asking you the question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious what it does to you. That's all. That's awesome. That's what... <laughs> I asked that. He said it. I asked him. He said it makes me feel warm. And I said it makes you feel warm. It's it's 98 degrees. You'd be feel you'd be feeling warm with or without the beetle nut. <laughs> Looked at me like, oh, you're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Beetle nut history with Larry Delbert. Uh, black and blue. Black and blue. Argentina. Argentina, why? Uh, because the, the steak down there is so, so good cooked Pittsburgh style. Yeah. Black and blue. Nice. Okay. Uh, you weren't ready for that one, were you? I didn't know what the hell was going on there. I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah, Pittsburgh style meat, you know what that is, right? Pittsburgh style, black and blue, they call it. <laughs> Where you blacken it, and you cook it at like. like 3,000 degrees on each side, and you leave it kind of blue in the middle almost, and black on the outside. It's called black and blue. Come this on. Is, this is the mind of Larry Dahlberg, like and I series. love it. I absolutely love it. <laughs> Mythological creature. Mythological creature. Uh, 
anthropological creature. Yeah. You had to, you had to run into one or two in your day. Anthropological creature. Yeah. I saw fly a kind of a it wasn't a saucer, but I did see a definitely a UFO. But I haven't seen any. I, mythology doesn't even. I think of uh, Scandinavia, but only because of mythology there. So no, I see. I don't have any voodoo. So that that category, you're going to really be drawing a blank in my subjective consciousness. I, what about a Sasquatch. That's a correct answer. That is a correct. Good job. You. you <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? I don't. No, no that's what I'm asking you. <laughs> Why, uh, why, why, why didn't I think of that? Have has that ever came to your mind on a trip across the world? Why didn't I think of that? Yeah, I've seen a few items, you know, but just stupid little inventions. Um, like there's one I see it in uh, Suriname when you open the door underneath your uh, a sink. It opens. The, there's a the little wastebasket under the lid opens when you open the door, and that closes when you shut it. And oh, also in Finland, in the toilets, when you fuck. Okay, here, you push a lever down. On the end of that lever is this chain or something. That chain goes down. It's hooked to a little dingus, and then it lifts it up. It's like a whole bunch of moving parts, and then you got. In Finland, it's just a straight thing that goes right straight up like this. And there's this little deal at the top. You go, foo, foo, but it flushes. It's just a straight line. It's so simple. No moving part. I mean, one moving part up and down. And I looked at that and I said, <clears throat> "Why didn't I think of that?" Those Finlands are smart. Why didn't, why didn't Kohler think of that? Yeah, yeah. they made their Rapala too. And they got all that going. <laughs> Actually, the Rapala was was made by a guy named Toivo. The first one. I mean, here's the deal. This is really interesting. I was over there. There's this lake, big lake called the Lake Paiani. And it covers a huge part of Finland. And there was this um, hermit named uh, Toivo that figured <laughs> out how to how to mix um, acetone with uh, acetate. It's uh, similar to what um, or celluloid we used to call it. It's what a photographic film. You know, if you expose overexpose film, it turns like clear. If you dump that into acetone, it turns into a slurry of uh, plastic. And then when it uh, you smear it on something. It gets nice and flat dries and you've got plastic and he was using that over the surface of uh, the cambrian layer of a, of a pine tree that has about the same density of balsa that he'd put up like a gum wrapper a cigarette wrapper with a cellophane over it and seal it with that stuff also made a lip out of it you can make a you know a lip out of that kind of stuff as well and then he was trading it for geese and other articles fish i've got a bunch of pictures of him and some of these lures and he showed the people in that area how to do that. Amongst them was uh, Lori Rappola and his uh, uh, brothers and uh, the people like, probably at Nils Master and uh, a whole bunch of people in the Turco uh, area. Uh, so that's really where that, that style of lure came from in that area became kind of the Silicon Valley of the lightweight uh, lure compared to the real heavy mechanical stuff that we built here in the US. Damn! Hey, I think here. I think that Larry Dahlberg won. Uh, there's no, the, the, no one has ever hijacked this game show as well. Maybe Gary no. Klein did, but but yeah. uh, but Larry, Larry Dahlberg, you won. You won something. I'm telling you right there. You definitely won. Good job, Larry. You didn't even have to use the buzzer once on you. Outstanding. Do you do any impersonations, Larry? Uh, I don't think so. No, you don't do like an Al Linder or anything impersonation. No, I, I I sometimes try to impersonate somebody that isn't uh, around. <laughs> like what does that mean? <laughs> I just like to kind of hang back. You know? I saw I impersonate somebody that isn't there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that works every time. Yeah. That's the most outstanding impersonation there is. Hey, um. <laughs> Uh, who's your guitar? That, that was amazing. Who who's your guitar hero? Who's your guitar hero, Larry? Actually, uh, I have many living right now. I really enjoy Joe Bonamassa. Okay, I think he really knocks it out. Uh, the earliest that I, I really like is a guy named Roy Buchanan. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Roy did some just amazing uh, things. Uh, Google uh, or uh, YouTube uh, "Sweet Dreams" by Roy Buchanan. Uh, there's just a whole bunch. Yeah, most of the stuff he recorded is kind of dumb, but as a <laughs> technical guitarist, he's just out of this world. I like how first you got guy, all eclectic on us there. That was yeah, pretty good. He, he does a, he first guy to do pinch harmonics. 
first guy to bend. He, uh, Jeff Beck is the closest thing to most of Jeff Beck's licks. Jeff, I hope you're listening, are ripped off of Roy Buchanan. The whole Jeff Beck technique is Roy Buchanan all over again, but Roy was better. Yeah, Jeff tunes in every week. Actually. He does. He's a big fan. And actually, Ronnie Wood, too. They're still fr- so Jeff Beck and Ingvar, Ron. Ingvar yeah, is on here. They, all the time they time watch. Too. They watch together. Yeah, Larry, ask me who my guitar heroes are. Uh, who are your guitar heroes? I thought you'd never ask, Larry. My guitar heroes um, are Keith Richards and Jimmy Page. Yeah, that's an interesting combination. Yeah, I mean Keith is the most simplistic form, in my opinion. Um, yeah, he's raw, sloppy, sloppy, beautiful. Yeah, uh, yeah. Some, sometimes he he hits a real good one. <laughs> you saw the Rolling Stones at Altamont in, in yes. 19... Yeah. What's that? Yeah, give me shelter. You know, the yeah. Movie Brothers shelter and sisters, what are we fighting for? That one. Yeah, I was there. I was right there. Dude. Right, maybe 50 feet from the stage. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's not, but wow, you're, you were at one of the biggest moments of history the most significant turning points in rock history right there. What was you it like, dude? you're going, any road will take you there. <laughs> what was it like being there? I mean, what was the... What was the... It was surreal. It was absolutely surreal. We left um, uh, midway through the Rolling Stones just because it was insane. And uh, we were back home in 37 hours from... Uh, drove back to uh, River Falls, Wisconsin from... Uh, Altamont actually stayed in Fresno overnight and got back in 37 hours in a 64 Chevy at about 114 miles an hour. Mama, get me out of here. Wow. So was it, was the chaos abounding? Is that why you left? I mean, yeah, that was, that was a big part of it. And there was just so many people. You couldn't believe what people were there. Your eyes had conked out before the people did looking over the horizon. Wow. That's, that's a, that's an amazing life experience. Hmm. That's yeah, it was. Uh, yeah. unbelievable. Hey, how come nobody ever wants to know what my guitar hero is? Who's your guitar hero? Hey, thanks, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm gonna go with Brian May. Brian May yeah. and yeah, Brian. Uh, and and uh, um, oh god, I'm sticking with Brian May. I can't. <laughs> there's nobody that holds a candle to him, in my opinion. He's the only guitar player in that band, and it was huge. Do you know who he is? From the Queen? From the Queen. From the Queen band. Yeah. 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 Dude's a monster. Brian May. Doesn't have to fly. It's just solid. Well, yeah, it isn't how many notes you play per second, per second, you know. Right. It's I thought you, you played that one. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was interesting that you listed Bonamasso. So they, oh, yeah. I mean, listen to him. And it's the width, the breadth of his... Uh, of, uh, uh, the, he plays at any and every genre if he wants to. He's a really good vocalist, and uh, he can really play guitar. Uh, tasty, tasty, tasty stuff. I mean, Willie Nelson's a great guitar player. Listen oh, to yeah. Willie. I mean, sure. He's just beautiful, beautiful. He can lungs. bounce that thumb like nobody else. Yeah, absolutely. No, yeah, I'm, check, anyhow. check out Buchanan and, and listen to Sweet Dreams as, as one to listen to. Okay, yeah, just, for, it's, for sure. It's a, a Patsy Cline tune, you know. But then, listen, then you'll want to listen to a few other things, and you'll see he's uh, he can play absolutely anything, and he invented a lot of the cool things that we take for granted. Uh, the volume knob, you know, where you uh, just uh, grab it with your little finger, and put, he was the first guy ever to do that. A lot, a whole bunch of stuff. Mm-hmm. Susie Q, that that was his first lick that was famous. Really? Was playing, nice. uh, who was it? Uh, somebody in the Snake Stretchers, or <laughs> get the name of the band? Uh, Butch Hawkins. Ooh, yeah, Ronnie Hawkins. That's it. Ronnie Hawkins and the Snake Stretchers, and they did Suzy Q, and that was that boom, 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 sure. boom, boom. Oh, that was a Roy at, I think, age 16. Wow. There you go, buddy. Th- those are selfish questions. I had to ask yeah. that. I apologize. Sorry, for fishing sorry, Fisherman. There. You guys, that guy, there's a guy right now that's playing the uh, pedal steel, uh, black guy, and he's ripping licks off, blues licks off a of pedal steel that just, well, just, it's astonishing. It's astonishing. What's his name? Do you know? I just can't remember his name just to escape me. He was so, he, The music was so incredible. It just, uh, it just like knocked a circuit out. On the steel guitar, on the pedal steel. On, yeah, on a pedal steel, but he's playing blues. He's not playing country stuff. Wow. It's, just, oh, it's, it's, it's almost unlawful. 
<laughs> I think Larry Cowman's interested in the show for the first time. Yeah, our, our, our audio guy, Larry, is really tuning in now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's your guitar heroes. Who is your fishing hero, Larry? Who's your fishing hero? Oh, man. I had a guy named J.C. Wells that I used to fish with a lot uh, that's dead. That was a saltwater guy that really showed me a lot. He was kind of a fishing hero. And my dad was a fishing hero. Uh, Living today. Hmm. I don't really have any heroes. I really have, I admire, uh, there's a fellow named Lefty Cray that uh, was on a post. Lefty's in his late 90s. and He just went into hospice. And uh, Lefty's a wonderful Mm -hmm. man. I've known him since I was in my 20s. I used to send him uh, flies before anybody knew what Flashaboo was. Uh, I had Flashaboo, man, uh, I made him flies, and uh, we corresponded. And uh, he's a pretty special dude. He's really a nice, nice man. Got a lot of contributions to the to the industry. Huge, yeah, huge man. And I did not know Lefty was in hospice right now. Yeah, he's he maybe doesn't want people in the room. Okay, but he's you know about come, kind of winding down. Uh, had some health issues, but he's just sharp than attack. He's, I mean, if he was running at half capacity, he'd be twice as sharp as most people are at their peak. He's just an amazing guy, kind. You had a chance to fish with him not too long ago, didn't you? Yeah, we were in Texas uh, fishing a little bit, and uh, we got to spend some time together. It was real good. Nice. Yeah. I, saw, I saw that on the book face. Y'all were throwing the uh, the double whopper plopper. The whopper yeah, buzz. Yeah, the first uh, prototypes of the double plopper. The Got some pretty big bass on him too. Yeah, he really, <laughs> he really liked that bait. He thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> the double plopper. Hey, Larry, um, we're about out of time. I'm getting the signal, man, and I just want to say how much this means to us to have you on this stupid show, man. I mean, yeah. it it, uh, it it means a lot to us for you to hang out and tell some fireside stories with us. Um, my my favorite show we've done in a long time, man. Well, that's 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 fun, and the fireside's good. As I told you, I was fishing today, and it was a little chilly out there. We caught a went three for three on, on muskies with my buddy Josh. Three for three. Bam, 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 man! We fished for for about two hours in a spot that I had a, my fish bone was wiggling, and we went over and caught three of them. Two real nice big ones too. So it was a good way to end the year, and I'm looking forward to Josh the IT guy. Three uh, fish Josh and two hours. I got two Joshes, uh, Big Josh and, and Other Josh. Okay. <laughs> they, both, they both own uh, bait stores, and they're both pretty good-sized dudes. One has got a Blue Ribbon Tackle in St. Paul or Oakdale, and the other's uh, got a store called Thorn Brothers. It's a musky shop Yeah. in, in Minneapolis. And uh, Big Josh, uh, Thorn Brothers, is a, uh, his name is Josh Roundsley at the stores, Thorn Brothers. But, yeah, he's my fishing buddy. He's a great big dude. He's uh, kind of like a bodyguard. If I fall and can't get up, he can like pick me up from his pocket. <laughs> and my dog, he's really good with my dog. My dog loves Josh. Is that Josh the IT guy? No, is that the same? No, that's a different Josh. That's IT Josh. IT Josh. You got Josh a lot of Josh over the place. <laughs> yeah, I'm not joshing about Josh's. We got a lot of Josh's. <laughs> Josh saved the day today. That's why we were he delayed a little. Oh, he's... and I've got this new camera, so yeah. and I got to make sure I turn it off so I don't get spied on by hackers. That's what I was yeah. told. <laughs> you to make your camera like go around the house and look. You know, I don't know. That's what I've heard. Of. <laughs> they do. That happens all the time. And so, you know, who else is spying on you is um, uh, Jeremy Wade. He will be spying on you. The River Monster guy will be spying on you through this new camera. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. <laughs> what? What's a great idea? Well, you know, he could spy on me. It'd be good. I could help him. <laughs> Larry, thank you so much, man, for, for joining us tonight. Do you have any last words for your fans out there, bud? Uh, well, sometimes fishing's like a wet bar. So how do you squeeze it the further it flies? <laughs> that needs to be left right there. That was outstanding. That's the quote of the week right there. Larry Dahlberg, thank you so much. We Are you going to be at the in Chicago this uh, this winter at the sports shows? I don't know. I, I haven't made any plans. You don't know yet. You just... As I got, I'm going uh, fishing to, I'm going to Louisiana in uh about two weeks or a little less. 
And I'm gonna throw big whopper ploppers for great big uh, redfish. That's so much fun. You just cannot believe how much fun that is to wow. work. They come, their whole heads come out and they eat it. It's just, it's just stupid how crazy it is. So we, and I'm looking forward to doing that. And I think I'm gonna go to Columbia in March and uh, fish for pyaras and big cats just for fun. No, no cameras or oh, they were pretty cameras. Good. I think down to, down to we're we're testing some rods also out in Louisiana. So we'll maybe bring camera down there. But but otherwise, I'm just fishing with my friends and my family and my grandkids. And life is good. That is awesome, dude. Larry, again, thank you so much. We will uh, we will catch you then, or we will catch you on another time. All right. Well, you have a, a wonderful, wonderful winter. All right. Thank you very Thanks, much. Larry. Ladies and gentlemen, that is Larry Dahlberg right there. We Skyped. We did it. We did it, Larry. We, we did it. We finally did it, Larry. We got right. it all have, together. Have a good night. You Me too. Are going to bed. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Thanks again. That's Larry Dahlberg. I'm Pat Remwick. This is Ryan Whitaker, JP High, Andrew Ellenberger, Baroness um, Von Chen is here, and... Larry Kyleman. Hey, before we go, yeah, well, I know I've been doing this a lot lately, but I got to thank Frank oh, from oh, Calumet Frank. Marine. Yeah, Frank at Calumet for Marine helping me change my uh, wheel bearing today on my trailer. He ha- he was he was like John Travolta in the movie it, Blowout. It took me nine hours, but without him, it would have taken eighteen. I think. Thank so, you very much. Big thanks to Frank. To Frank at Calumet Marine. Go see him. He'll hey, fix everything you got. Go see Frank. Everything. And we, uh, we are off the next two weeks, 22nd and 29th. We return on, uh, on December 6th. Um, in the meantime, to keep you busy, uh, don't forget we are on the iTunes. Uh, we are on straightcast.net. All of the past episodes are available to you there. And uh, don't forget to check out our buddy um, Seth Fighter on the Ike Live broadcast this, uh, this Sunday. That should be, that'll be an enjoyable uh, episode, and we really will get to find out if... Um, if uh, Jacob Wheeler is really Joe Thomas's um, love that's child, that's what everyone that's, wants to know. That's what don't everybody, call it a mullet. It's that, not a mullet. That's that. That is true. Um, we will see you then. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Thank you to those tuning in, to the viewers, to the sponsors. Uh, without you, this maniacy would not happen. We bid you adieu. I'm Pat Renwick. I am out. <laughs>